In this country, we assume the struggle for freedom is over. It is never over. Sooner or later, every American has to fight for the freedoms they hold most dear. Okay, I'm watching you. Okay. I got it. Okay. You got some finger locks too, right? For a decade, yeah. Dan and Sue McDivitt have outwitted gravity, climbing where few have dared to go. It looks pretty safe. It's not like I'm gonna hit anything if I fall here. Their lives literally hang on an issue. Should they be allowed to use steel bolts drilled into the rock, or do others have a say? The valley floor is 3,000 feet below. Well, these bolts are nice and new. Many of the bolts in Yosemite are older bolts that uh, cause some concern because like across the way on El Capitan, some of them are over 35 years old and they should be able to hold thousands of pounds so you don't have to worry about your anchor pulling out and yet some of these bolts will fail by just standing on them with body weight. Uh, you can definitely climb in Yosemite Valley without drilling holes and putting in bolts. Now, I mean, why should someone have the right to be able to go any place they want to on a rock? Dan, can you hold me just for a second here? Yeah, I, I don't want to shake out this one arm. Okay. El Cap and Half Dome are like it lets off, gets a very new, yeah. sacred, holy places to a lot yeah. of people, climbers as well as non-climbers. And the, the idea, the symbology of, of taking a machine and, and drilling a hole into the rock, that's a very strong symbol. You're, you're desecrating this holy object. Anybody can walk in wilderness wherever they want. We should have the freedom to climb wherever we want. Climbing is one of the great sports where you, you can get involved in something that allows you to experience the real feeling of freedom. And to have that taken away, I think, would be yeah. a crime. We have to draw the line somewhere. Yes, the valley's developed. Yes, we have roads in the park. But we've drawn a line around those things and said, beyond this, no more. We have to put helmets on our kids. We have to smoke where they say. We got to wear our seatbelt. I don't know where it's going to stop. <laughs> to some, each bolt is a blemish. To Sue and Dan McDivitt, yeah. it is everything. That was exciting. <laughs> Still, one bolt leads to more. More climbers, more risks, a defaced outdoor cathedral. But bolts save lives make possible new climbs. So, you go to the right here? so should we accept someone else's limits? Whose mountain is it anyway? Yeah, it's like we're on a swing, but we don't have a seat, really. This is our front porch. Freedoms are precious, but never absolute. Rights clash, limits get tested, new challenges require new responses. It's a balancing act. In our democracy, we set and reset limits so that all of us are free. What I'm opposed to is defacing private property. I do not condone graffiti at all. I want people to know who I am when I'm dead. They're artists, I mean, what they create is art. Graffiti is a symbol of hopelessness. And what we're about is providing hope, hope to neighborhoods and hope to young people. We're gonna use this just like a transparent film. My name, my tag. On any wall, in Philadelphia, the answer is no. Taggers or graffiti artists caught in the act have a choice, clean walls or attend art classes with other kids. Here, the challenge to find new freedom of expression within limits. So instead of doing graffiti removal, you're doing the, you're doing the workshop? Yeah, well, they gave me a choice. Well, I did, you know, to paint the wall and everything. What skills do they have to sort of get out there and make that connection, to, to sort of be seen, to be heard, to have other people know them? I mean, you know, I mean, it's hard for any of us, you know? It's a sort of life is just a struggle. But when you're sort of working at a deficit, when your options are limited or, or zero, I mean, how are you going to do it? You're going to do it however it comes along. And it happens to come along in the form of graffiti. So that's easy, it's quick, and that's, what's, that's what they're going to do. But when you can replace it with something, then, I mean, suddenly you can see some of these kids really blossom. What you do here is what you the same thing you can do on the wall. You use the most space, you know what I mean? Try to make the best out of the space and try to make it stand out, you know, so it can be seen. 
Inviting, you know, sort of a lot of people to take part in a mural process, you're still out there, you're making a mark, it's public, it's bold, people get to see it. So I think it's really interesting to see that change happen from being sort of a rampant graffiti writer to sort of being on the other side of the law. Hey, Alvino! Alvino! Listen, um, I finished this last, this end here. To be so seen by more people, graffiti story, is often right? up high. So are many of Philadelphia's more than 1,200 murals. For each mural, local residents decide on the subject, landscapes, history, local heroes, even tributes to the neighbors themselves. The murals are rarely vandalized. When you do a mural and you see people take a you know, vacant lot that's filled with debris and that debris gets carried away and then it turns into a garden and a place where people can meet and discuss ideas and talk about how they can better the neighborhood. Maybe it's people sweeping the street, maybe it's a couple houses get painted, maybe some cars get towed, maybe we sign up some kids for anti-graffiti. But those are definite changes that happen as a result of this mural painting. We do make the best of what we have. That's why we have so many gardens, because we have so many empty lots, and we rather see the gardens than to see the weeds. This was an empty lot that people used to come and uh, dump anything that they didn't want. It was full of old building materials and uh, broken furniture and uh, all sorts of debris. The community came together, and it happened all together like. We couldn't have done it alone, you know. Uh, this is a picture of Edie Matos. One of the women who has um, done a lot of work in the area, especially in the gardens, and one of the people that uh, is a real uh, hero in the neighborhood, because she has helped um, transform this area into what, what it is today, which is an area filled with beautiful gardens and, and several murals. real family album, some portraits of the surprising people who make this democracy work. No washing cars and driveways, no plastic house numbers. No metal swings. There is no graffiti here. No garbage, no loud radios, no choices. No open garage doors. <clears throat> Excuse me, 300 Maple Avenue, but we have spoken about this. Thank you so much. Some 100,000 planned communities now wind their way through this country with mountains of regulations. No statues on front lawns. No unapproved paint schemes. Limits must have their limits. That's why the freedom to question is essential. Two open garage doors. Do we have a rebellion on our hands? The historic question that birthed our democracy. Whose country is it, anyway? In Virginia's House of Burgesses, Thomas Jefferson's words echo. Can anyone reason why 160,000 electors in the island of Great Britain should give law to four million in the state of America, every individual of whom is equal to every individual of them in virtue, in understanding, and in bodily strength? Jefferson with Patrick Henry. Richard and Francis Lee, Dabney Carr, thought that other colonists must see the issue as clearly as did they. Was it to be British authority or American rights? They continue their talk, the currency of every democracy, at the Raleigh Tavern. Freedom craves company. They compare notes of other confrontations, propose a free flow of timely information, start a revolution, 
built on words. As I was saying to Patrick earlier, I believe it would be in our best interest to form a group of deputies at some central place. A committee of correspondence would be our best instrument for intercommunication. We, we could show a unity of action throughout the colony. Gentlemen, I do not want to read about the Gas Bay incident in the Virginia Gazette. I want to hear about it directly from one of our friends in Rhode Island. And, and we need to let the Bostonians know that, that we feel the same as they do. Exactly. A committee. A committee. Here, here. One of Maine's largest industries and the symbol of its rugged independence is lobster. But where there'll always be enough lobsters, overfishing could wipe out the industry and with it, a way of life. If I was working for someone else, I, I'd know I'd have an easy day painting or something like that inside, nice and warm next to a stove or something. I gave that up to go out and eat salt water all day and freeze to death. And it's kind of strange. I have to ask myself why I did it every once in a while, but um, when, I, when I get out there and I get a good haul and come home, sell my lobsters and go home, I feel, I feel great. There's nothing like it. It's becoming more and more difficult for people to pursue that kind of, of lifestyle. Um, there are an awful lot of, of forces um, working against them, if you will, to be able to remain an independent portion of the, of the economy. With their future in question, Maine's lobstermen gather to plead their case. The state has proposed new rules and limits. Good evening. Could everyone uh, grab a seat here so we can get going? It's good to see so many people here. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Bill Brennan. I'm the commissioner of Maine's Department of Marine Resources. I'm also a member of the New England Fisheries Management Council. We'll be con conducting this public hearing tonight. I'd like to uh, stress that this is a uh, participatory democracy, and so uh, throughout this public hearing, I would, would really be encouraging all of you to come up here and, and, uh, and speak. There's no question in my mind that we need a moratorium. We've been deemed overfished. We don't need more effort put on the resource by more people in. If you're going on a quota system, there's no way to enforce it. And I can't understand why a gentleman of, the, of a council would jeopardize us fishermen no into putting another increase on our lobsters in the measurement and turn around and lose more market. We, the fishermen, have been failing. Pioneers came to blows in America's West over how to share the land. The conflict in the Northeast is how to share the fishing grounds. Let's face it, the fisheries really is the last bastion of open range. But there really has never been any property right assignments, and, and fishermen feel very strongly about that and who gets access and, and how uh, access is maintained. Boats called draggers work the international waters off the coast of Maine. They pull huge nets across the ocean bottom, scooping up lobsters along with everything else. Season after season, traditional lobstermen work within measured limits to preserve their precious crop. The technology for trapping really hasn't changed in 200 years. It's you know pretty basic. You put bait in the trap, you throw the trap overboard where you think there's some lobsters, and if the lobsters go in, you catch them. You're, you're targeting a certain size. These vents in the traps here, you, as you can see in the back, they let out the juveniles, and the lobsters go in, they have a free meal, and they go back out. Obviously, you can't catch real big lobsters, which we feel in Maine and in is the conservation ethic that we want to see reproduce the stock. What we do is we have a five inch maximum and roughly that translates to about a four and a half pound lobster. Anything over that, we throw back. A lobster fisherman is a territorial fisherman. He sets his trap there and it stays there. And a dragger fisherman is not. He goes, he throws, toes through the bottom. 10 minutes after he leaves, another dragger comes throws through the same bottom. It catches fish. Canada, they had the, the best fishing in the world off the Grand Banks and off Newfoundland. As soon as dragon started and they were able to go in with nets and, and catch large, large volumes of fish, in 30 years, they decimated the resource that had lasted for 400 years. If you talk to some of the old time lobstermen, they'll say the same thing. I only fished with 500 pots. Now I have a guy alongside of me fishing with 5,000 pots. And how can I compete with him? We don't need them in the lobster industry 
to do the same thing to us when we're trying to conserve the stocks and build up the stocks for the future. We don't need draggers taking them. If they want to go lobstering and they've got a permit, let them go. They both want to be in the same place at the same time because that's where their resource is, but they do not work well together. The offshore lobsterman wants the whole bottom there is. He's got to decide that, hey, I can't set 1,000 pots. I can't set 5,000 pots. We've got to divide the ocean up between us because we all have a right to be there. We've had uh, agreements where they would set in one area, we would fish in another area. Them agreements have gone by the wayside. I don't see an easy answer. I mean, we, we feel we're right, they feel they're right. If we're not going to work together, we're going to have war. Are we doomed to overfish the ocean in the name of individual liberty and survival? Or can we coordinate the use of our resources to preserve what we hold in common? We're on the third year going downhill, and I'll just hang with it as long as I can, and when I can't make enough to feed my family, then I'll just, I'll just have to go ashore. In our democracy, freedom circles through our lives. We fight to explore, we gather to question, we set and reset our limits and chase our dreams. At the San Francisco School of Circus Arts, a new student is about to fly for the first time. I guess I see democracy as freedom. I equate democracy with freedom. If you don't push yourself, push that envelope, try something that you didn't think you could do, you'll never know that you could have. Freedom is risk. Freedom is trust. Freedom almost always requires something of us. Ready, go. When I say the word hemp, I want you to let go and just drop on your seat. OK, then hold on to your safety lines then. Grab your safety lines. Maybe our most precious freedom is the freedom to fail. It lets us try again. With a rock in hand, the temptation is almost overpowering. No one has fixed these broken windows. It is the same with the community. If we don't fix what is wrong, north of the Arctic Circle, a code to live by. Every Inupiat is responsible to every other Inupiat for the survival of their cultural spirit and the values and traditions through which it survives. Here, in northwest Alaska, Inupiat Eskimos have survived for thousands of years, treating the gifts of the landscape with respect, hunting and fishing according to seasonal migrations. But this century changed everything. The world came to them. Air travel, satellite TV, stores, a cash economy. The Inupiat settled into places like Katsabue and stopped hunting for their futures. They started to see the world and themselves differently. You develop a very pessimistic view of yourself. After a while, we began to um, experience suicides among our society, which is very foreign to the Inupiaq culture. I've talked to our elders. They have wept. They have prayed. But it's so foreign to them. Basically, Nobody's going to come up here or care enough about us to do what we have to do for ourselves and for each other. We're 
Anakum. The community turned to its elders, who said young people were losing their sense of identity and heritage. The elders drew up a list of values called Inupiat Iliquisat. Knowledge of language, sharing, respect for others, cooperation. The values were printed on wallet-sized cards. Posters went up around town. Responsibility to others had to become a habit if they were going to survive. Family roles, hunter success, humor, responsibility to tribe. When we hear of young men who take their lives, they probably don't know enough of the responsibility to family, to community, to the tribe. We're very dependent on seal oil. It's just a necessity in a cold climate. Our men, our children, are taught not to be boastful. Like, like the old folks say, these seals give themselves to you. When I was growing up here, the first seal or the first beluga that the people brought in actually was for the community. The people could go to that family, to that household, and bring home a pot full of meat and blubber and whatever and cook it at home. When we share what we have, it makes you feel good inside. It makes your spirit feel good. You, ha you have done something for somebody else. You don't think about suicide. You don't think about harming somebody else. It just makes you so proud of humanity. Just, just human beings, you know. Knowing where you've come from and who you've come with helps you see where you can go. Taking responsibility for that journey is the essence of a Nupiat Ilitquisat. What if a friend of yours was one of the surprising number of high school students who bring a gun to school each year? Would you do something? Would you tell the authorities? You don't rat on your friends. My friend.